The topic tonight is the way forward for humanity, Islam or Christianity. And it's put as a question because we have two speakers who are going to suggest different answers to that question, Islam or Christianity. The aim of tonight is respectful dialogue in which different points of view, even competing points of view, are put forward. Universities are places for discussion and engagement, of seeking wisdom and truth, and that is the spirit of tonight. It's not about voting for winners or losers, but of listening and discerning. So I'm glad that you've made the time to come and join us. My name is Tim Thorburn. Um, I'm part of the Christian Union at UWA, and I'll be acting as the moderate, moderator tonight, which just means I ring bells and try and keep things going. Uh, our two speakers tonight are seated at the table. Utman Badar uh, will be speaking for Islam, and Samuel Green for Christianity. As you came in, you should have received uh, two pieces of paper, one a small uh, piece of paper on which you can uh, uh, ask your questions that you would like to ask. I'll explain how that will happen in a minute or give feedback. And a handout from Samuel uh, that will help you follow his uh, presentation. Could you please turn off your mobile phones if you haven't done that already so that uh, we're not interrupted by unwelcome interruptions. And this is a public event that is being uh, videoed and uh, will be put up on public media like YouTube. I'm not quite sure where else it might be put up. You can see the format uh, behind me on the screen. Um, each speaker will be given 25 minutes to uh, uh, present their case. Um, uh, uh, Utman uh, won the toss, so he will go first. And then each speaker will have 10 minutes to reply uh, to the other case. Then there'll be 10 minutes each for uh, uh, each uh, speaker to cross-examine the other on their presentation and, uh, uh, and, and their convictions. We'll then have a brief pause, which will give you an opportunity to write questions on your piece of paper for either of the speakers. We'll collect those questions, distribute them to the speakers, and they will be given 10 minutes to answer the questions directed at them and then concluding uh, statements for 90 seconds each. So it'll probably take us um, uh, over an hour and a half. Uh, I encourage you to listen carefully, uh, to listen discerningly, and to engage in the spirit of the evening. So without further ado, um, I will ask Uthman Badar to come and begin his presentation. Would you please welcome him? Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good to be in Perth, uh, even though I've only been here a very short time. Um, I, I've liked what I've seen, at least in terms of the, the, quiet, the quiet life, I guess, compared to the, the rat race in Sydney. Um, we've got a very interesting topic at hand, obviously, uh, controversial at levels, but I think it's very good that we are able to discuss and to debate uh, these sorts of issues because I think that's the best way that uh, mature adults can engage um, in terms of the adoption of different beliefs. So the question for us today is the way forward for humanity, Islam or Christianity. Uh, lo and behold, I'm going to argue that the way forward is Islam. Uh, and I'm going to proceed in the following manner. Obviously it's a question we're being asked to judge between two uh, options. So there has to be a criteria of judgment. So I'm going to propose a criteria of judgment. And I'm going to talk quickly a little bit about a couple of key principles in making that judgment. And that's certainly not an exhaustive analysis, it's just a couple of points that I think are sometimes missed in um, inter-religious discussion, particularly Muslim-Christian discussion. And then I'm going to present my analysis as to why I think uh, Islam is the way forward. So what do I mean by criteria? Or what do I think the criteria is? 
I think it's at two levels. One is in terms of the rationality or the coherence of the foundation of the creed or the religion, um, having a rational creed or worldview. And in terms of Islam and Christianity, I'm going to look at that in terms of God's existence and attributes, uh, and in terms of the claim of revelation from God, so the Quran and the Bible. Uh, but at the same time, that's that's sort of the foundation, the theory, if you will, the, the ideology, the worldview. Um, I think it's also important that uh, any successful system that can solve the problems of humanity provides systems, and I use the word broadly, uh, that's, that can solve the problems that humanity faces. And here I, talk, I don't talk about specific modern day problems, although they are the manifestation of what we, se what we seek to solve, but the issues that arise from human interaction per se, whether, whether that was 2000 years ago or today, so economic, social, legal, judicial, political uh, frameworks that are required for um, harmonious and um, successful human interaction and existence in societies. So I'm going to look at that from both, again, the theory and the practice. The theory, do you have, for example, an economic framework, uh, a social framework, a political framework that people can use? Um, and in terms of the practice, can, do we have an example to see in the thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand years of the respective religion's history of a successful implementation of those systems? So that's my criteria. Uh, but in terms of making the judgment, uh, I think a couple of principles are key here, and these, again, it's not an exhaustive list. There's many other principles that should be kept in mind, but it's two that I think are important. One, I think, is that a lot of the times, whether someone's pointing out contradictions in the other religion's text, or pointing out things that I think are, oh my God, what does this say? A lot of the time it's a case of a, you know, a Muslim giving their interpretation about what they think a Bible verse means, and vice versa. And I think that's not appropriate, given that the concern is what the people who follow that book understand and how they practice it. Uh, so I think unless you can show rigorously that your assessment, your interpretation is, is better than the interpretation of the scholars of that religion, those, those, the latter interpretations should be used. And I think that's a rather uncontroversial proposition. The other one I think that's important is in terms of judging between a limited number of options, in our case two, uh, it's important to keep in mind the principle of absolute versus comparative superiority and I call this the oranges rule. Has anyone heard of it? Probably not because I came up with it last night. <laughs> As I was, uh, but I'm going to try to publish this in some peer reviewed journal. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, it's just an analogy that I make. You know, consider you have two oranges, orange A and orange B. And we decide collectively that our criteria of judging which orange is better is sweetness. The more sweeter it is, the better it is. And the more sour it is, well, that will take points off. We agree on this. That doesn't have to be the case, but as a hypothetical, we agree. But we find that both of them have a level of sweetness and both of them have a level of sourness. Do we then stop and not make a judgment? Or will the judgment be made on the basis of which one is relatively more sweeter and which one is relatively less sour? I think that the latter position is clearly the position that any rational judgment should take. So I call that the oranges rule. Not that I'm saying Islam or Christianity are oranges. So, to jump into it, the creed. Have a look at the creeds. Uh, and again, in all of the points, we can talk about many aspects. I'll pick out the one that I think is the main one. So in terms of the creed, uh, I think the fundamental difference is between the idea of the unity and the trinity. And I argue that the difference here is between an objectively provable proposition in terms of the unity and the, the existence of a, of a uh, unique and one God as opposed to a mystery that requires faith alone in terms of the Trinity. Um, and we find in this respect that the Trinity is not expounded, by expounded I mean elucidated in detail in the Bible. The text is not clear. At, at best we have uh, verses where people say, oh well, this refers to it in this sense, this refers to it in that sense, and therefore we have many different conceptions, various conceptions of what the Trinity means, various non-Trinitarian theologies as well within the framework of Christianity. And we also find a tension between reason and faith in this respect in Christianity to the extent that uh, people as erudite as St. Thomas Aquinas who put forth quite a compelling arguments notwithstanding what the new atheists would say about the existence of God 
at the same time had to say things like, well, there are still some objects of faith, like the Trinity, and the Trinity one of the main examples that he used, that, in, that lie entirely beyond our capacity to understand and to prove rationally uh, in an objective manner without reference to the revelation. And I think that's a problem. We also find within um, certain Christian streams the, the, idea, the, the, the proposition of fideism or, or faithism, what is otherwise known as faith, feed, fide in, in Latin means faith, that the religious belief must be based on leaps of faith rather than the mind. And again, the point is very simple, that there shouldn't be an exception for religion. If we accept as human beings that our intellect is uh, our guide, or our, our initial guide at least in life, or the leading guide, then it shouldn't be a difference between uh, the way we, 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 we carry ourselves in all other aspects of life and religion. So if you're not going to make leaps of faith, in anything else, in, in believing that if you open your cupboard you're going to go through to uh, the land of Narnia because there's no evidence for that, then certainly that shouldn't be the case in any realm of life, uh, particularly not religion. And then obviously we have, uh, given that tension that I'm talking about in reason and faith, again people as erudite and accepted as Martin Luther saying things like, as his well-known well quote, that reason is the devil's bride, and he's another word as well which I won't use, starting with W. Um, an enemy of God that must be sacrificed. That's one angle in terms of the creed. The other part of the creed, of course, is the revelation. And this is very important in our dialogue, uh, Samuel and myself, this morning or this afternoon. Uh, there was a discussion about, well, you know, the prophets, the Old Testament or the New Testament, do we, which one is acceptable, which one is not acceptable, should we use all of them, how do we do that? And that's a very important discussion, and I said at the time that I don't think we can presume that we should use all of them, or some of them, or one or the other. Again, it has to be demonstrated and it has to be shown that uh, one or two or all of them are acceptable. And so in terms of the revelation being a rational acceptance of this, there's two areas. Number one, establishing that it is from God. And again, not in a circular manner, not saying, you know, not quoting from the Bible or the Quran to show that God, that this is revelation from God. That is clearly circular and that's not acceptable. Um, and number two, if it is from God, and obviously the, idea, the, the preservation from that point till the present is also a very important consideration. So I'm going to move forward um, and start with the preservation aspect. I'll come back to the establishment um, later. In terms of the Quran and its pre preservation, the Qur'an has been preserved both in the oral and the written traditions. And I, I think this is a very important distinction because in essence the oral tradition is the primary source, it is the primary reference point. The, the, the written tradition is supplementary, it's a reference point to make sure that we can go back and have um, a, second, a second authentication, if you will. But the oral is the original. And the oral preservation is through unbroken chains of multiple recurring transmission, what we call tawatur, in the sciences of of, uh, of legal interpretation and of hadith, uh, and this this basically means that the Quran, the Prophet, the Prophet revealed to him, he he passed it on to the companions, people around him, they memorized it, they passed it on to people after them, they memorized it, on and on, and we're talking we're talking hundreds of thousands of people in each generation one after the other after the other till this day and time. That is the original source and you can find again in, today in the world you'll find in the millions people who know the Quran from cover to cover off by heart but I want you, they're not the source, the source is those who would probably number in the hundreds of thousands who have been who authenticated scholar from scholar from scholar. A scholar who knows the whole thing by heart with its variant readings from another scholar who's, author, who's authorized him all the way back to the Prophet and you'll find these in the hundreds of thousands. That is the original preservation of the Qur'an. And that's why we find in the hadith the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet peace be upon him, saying that, I shall, that God said, it's in the hadith Qudsi, that I shall reveal to you a book which even water cannot wash. And the point of that is that the book is not tangible, it's oral, and nothing can touch it as opposed to previous revelations. And this is a very important part, I think, a distinction between the Islamic and the Christian traditions in terms of preservation, where the Muslim scholars came up with this uh, very important idea of the isnad, which is the chain of narration, where that we will not accept reports 
Reports are a source of knowledge, but we have to be sure about the source and the level of acceptability of this report, so the chain of narration is required. If you come to me and say, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so lived a hundred years before you, I will not accept that unless you tell me where you got it from. So you will tell me, I heard this from so-and-so, from so-and-so, who heard it from so-and-so, who heard it from the original source. And the scholars will then, at each point, assess the person, find out where they live, did they meet this person, did they not meet the person that's been claimed, and then make a judgment on the chain. And this is very important. Uh, and both the Quran and the Hadith have the Isnad, whereas uh, not only the Bible but none of the Christian scriptures have any uh, Isnad as such or any chain of narration. And this is a point that has been touched upon even by Western academics. So Bernard Lewis writes in, in, in Islam in History that from an early date Muslim scholars recognized the danger of false testimony and hence false doctrine and developed an elaborate science for criticizing tradition their careful scrutiny of the chains of tr transmission and their meticulous collection and preservation of variants in the transmitted narratives give to medieval Arabic historiography a professionalism and sophistication without precedent in antiquity and without parallel in the contemporary medieval West. By comparison, the historiography of Latin Christendom seems poor and meager, and even the more advanced and complex historiography of Greek Christendom still falls short of the historical literature of Islam in volume, variety, and analytical depth. And of course, Bernard, Bernard Lewis is, is far from being a Muslim, he's, a, he's, he's an Orientalist. Um, but that is what he said. As for the written tradition, again, the written is still very important. Um, and uh, quickly to go through how that was preserved, the Prophet, having the Quran being revealed to him, peace be upon him, would instruct his scribes to write down the revelation um, when it was revealed, and he would also tell them, put it between this and put it between that, and there will be a process of um, authenticating that. And by his death, the entirety of the Quran, and all of this is documented in, in various traditions, again, traditions that have been authenticated by the process I've mentioned, uh, the entirety of it was written on various articles, not on paper. Paper was a rare commodity at the time. Some of it was on paper, but the vast majority was on tablets of stone, parchments of leather, and so on and so forth. But it was not collated into one book. It was on different articles. Uh, the first Caliph, Abu Bakr, then commissions the first compilation in 1634. Right? Well, that's the start of his, his caliphate. It's only two years since the Prophet's death. And Zaid, who was one of the leading scribes of the Prophet, led the compilation using a meticulous methodology. That methodology was, first of all, Zayd himself was a, what we call a hafid, someone who knows the Quran from cover to cover, off by heart. He knew it. With him, leading the compilation was the, was the second to be Caliph Omar, who was also a hafid. He knew the Quran off by heart. Uh, but the, what I mean by meticulous methodology is that oh, someone who knows it by heart couldn't just go, okay, well, I'm going to write it down. Or to use the corroboration of a few other memorizers and write it down. They didn't just do that. On top of that, they did that, but on top of that, a public pronouncement was made that anyone who has any written material should bring it forth to the committee and it will be um, examined. But none of it was accepted except only if the person could bring two witnesses, different from themselves, to show that not only was it written, but it was written in the company of the Prophet and with his instruction or under his purview. So using all three of these, not one or the other or the third, but all three together, he compiled the Quran and the end product was the collection of the entire thing, verses in order, but the surah is not arranged still, the chapters were not arranged. Uh, each, rather, each chapter was written separately in folders, but all on paper and they were kept separately. This was then transferred to the Caliph, later on to the second Caliph Omar, when he passed away to his daughter. Uh, until when Uthman commissions the final or the second compilation in 60, 651. And again, note the time. This is now about 20 years out from the Prophet's death. So again, Zaid, and again, note the, the commonality. Zaid is the, the main scribe. He's the, he's the one who compiled it the first time. He comes again to compile it the second time. So that consistency uh, and the connection is there. He leads a team of four to use the previous compilation to make transcripts because by now the, the, the caliphate had expanded uh, quite vastly and uh, issues were arising to do with the variants which I'll speak about in the, the frontiers. So the idea was he made the multiple transcripts, made seven of them. In this the Surah order was established 
the script was written as in the previous ones without any diacritical marks which is the short vowels without any dots thus catering for all of the variant readings of the Quran at the same time all the compil all other compilations once this was done so in other words in, in, in sort of Christian terminology once the Quran was canonized and we have the piece um, all other individual compilations were, were gathered or the pronouncement was made to gather them um, I doubt he would be able to complete that in a perfect manner uh, but they were called and all these pieces were destroyed so as to establish a final accepted reference point and to establish uniformity in terms of script incorporation of accepted recitals and a sequence of the surahs a little bit about variant readings because I know this will be you know be made an, an issue of um, and it's important anyway because you know uh, if we're arguing that the Quran is preserved but there's variant readings and that question has to be addressed the Quran as mentioned in the hadith by the Prophet himself was revealed in seven ahruf which is the Arabic word the, the, the singular is harf and uh, it means modes in seven modes it was revealed um, which result in multiple readings recitations not different given the Semitic nature of the Arabic language to the different recitations of the Old Testament in the original Hebrew that various different Jewish uh, sects or groups use such as the uh, such as various groups of the Jews they use with the original Hebrew uh, they have different reasons because Hebrew is a Semitic language just like Arabic and the vowels uh, can be left off now what is the difference what is the result of these very readings number one the change between the different readings is predominantly in accent and in pronunciation i.e. in recitation the recitation the voweling the, the, the length of the voweling the um, various which is which is a detailed science in what we call the science of tajweed or the recitation of the Quran um, more rarely there is also a change in the word but on a uniform script that's important and I'll probably touch upon this in, in, in the reply or the Q&A because um, I'm sure Sam will bring up some examples to show why some of these variants are in his view an issue so but the same script there's no voweling because there's no voweling using the same orthographic script what we call the rasam you can have different words because the dots and the vowels can be put differently uh, even more really but existent you have change in nominal meaning change in tense he they passive active as well this is quite rare though and however the point is that there is never a change in the point of the text the theme that is being conveyed and in fact when we look at some examples I'll show why because you know someone may ask well okay that's fair enough so but what's the point of having great readings when we look at some examples I'll actually show uh, the benefit um, of having some of these variant readings but the point is that all of these were preserved in Othman's compilation because there was no diacritical marks, there was no dots on it that were all preserved and they are all used around the world today to differing levels of uh, where which one is used the, the Hafs transmission is the most popular in the Muslim world but the others are used, all of them are used in different parts of the world and all of them are available as well uh, and again here I think it's important to note what um, Western academics have said about variant readings and these are some quotes from um, from Adrian Brockett who writes that all these points he, study, he studies the point, all these points to a remarkably unitary transmission in both the graphic form and the oral form um, and he goes on effectively to say what I've said that there are sometimes differences in meaning and he points to one specific verse where he thinks there's, there's, there's an issue of the meaning but largely that the limits of the variation clearly establish that they are a single text and that have been preserved um, I have something about manuscript evidence here uh, some of this is that we do have manuscript evidence of the Quran and again uh, it's not perfect but on a relative analysis far better than the manuscript evidence that we have for the, for the Old and the New Testaments um, there are various manuscripts in different parts of the world that are mentioned there and there has also been research done to show that there is no real difference in the variants and that we can prove the preservation from that time to this time that's an example of the manuscript in Tashkent which is from the second century Hijri so for example Arbery again an orientalist in his translation of the Quran he says that apart from certain ortho, ortho logical modifications of the original somewhat primitive method of writing 
uh, intended to render unambiguous and easy the task of reading and recitation the Quran has printed in the 20th century is identical with the Quran as authorized by Uthman more than 1300 years ago. Again, a non Muslim um, and an Oriental, a, a student of the thing, the Islam and the Quran. What can we say about the Bible? Well, the Gospel, for starters, were written decades after Jesus. Straight up, we have a, bit, we have a gap. They're written by anonymous authors who did not meet Jesus nor see him. Right? Um, with the exception of Luke. We don't know who the others were. There are different guesses and estimations as to who they were. Um, the first canon of the New Testament was established in the 4th century, 350 CE. First canon where the, ch where the church says this is what we believe, given all the variants that we have, this is what we believe is inspired. Of course, that was still fluid for a long time afterwards because the early versions uh, later had sometimes entire books removed. Like for, uh, one example is the, uh, the Shepherd of Hermas. Um, Martin Luther, as an example, as late as his period, which is very late, thought that Revelations was not inspired. He thought it wasn't inspired, and Calvin did write a commentary on it. Uh, and there are obviously uh, uh, major variations between the various canons, ranging from the 66 books of the Protestant, Protestant canon to the 84 books of the Eastern Orthodox Bible. Of course, the main ones, Protestant and Roman Catholic, 66 and 72 books. And again, that's a very important um, as we'll see as we, as we go along. Also a little bit about the manuscript evidence. <coughs> you had some quotes, I'm probably going to run out of time here. Um, so I might move on a little bit here and come back to these if it's relevant in uh, the Q&A. There's also a, a, a discussion here about the claim to divine knowledge, because preservation is one thing, so you can prove now, let's say even if we agree that you know, the Bible or the Quran is preserved from when it was revealed, but that doesn't prove that it's from God originally. That has to be proven as well, separately. Uh, and again, I would argue that the Quran, we can, that, that can be done using both arguments of inimitability and rational deduction as to the possible sources, given accepted facts. In fact, one of our pamphlets there has all the details as to that argument. Um, and again, in various comments by Western academics to that end as well. And I have, none of these have I used any Muslim um, scholarship to quote, not because I don't trust them, but because to be uh, objective. With the Bible, there is, again I will argue, I'm happy to be corrected and shown otherwise by Samuel, there is no way to show without reference to itself that it comes from God. Without quoting the Bible itself, there's no way to show that it's from God. And obviously if you're going to refer to the thing itself, then that's a circular argument. To end, in terms of the systems, again, and I want you to keep the practical issue in mind here. We live in a, in a current world, even though theoretically this should be the case anyway, having those systems, but we currently live in a world where half of humanity lives on less than $2.50 a day. And in fact, we're 80% lives on less than $10 a day. And that should be astonishing statistics to anyone. Uh, there are huge wealth inequalities. 24,000 children die every day due to poverty, according to UNICEF statistics. Um, child sexual abuse, rape of women, issues, and again here I'm not picking on uh, you know, I have quite a UK and US, the Muslim world is also a shambles. It's, it's an absolute shambles. I don't distinguish in that respect. But the point is that it's very much a troubled world. So what systems, what practical systems do Islam and Christianity offer in this regard? In terms of the theory, I will argue that there is scant theory in terms of any political economic frameworks that we find in the Old or the New Testament. In fact, they rather provide justification for secularism, which, which for me is a very irrational argument for anyone that believes in an all-knowing, all-powerful God. As opposed to, and in practice, well, there's no example of a successful state based on Christianity. Um, the only experiences in the Middle Evil Age are, are, are pretty um, uh, horrendous. In terms of Islam, the theory, Again, I will argue, and I'm running out of time, so I'll put a touch upon this later on. I argue that there are frameworks, economic, social, legal, political, and so forth. The Prophet showed by example because he was a statesman, not just a messenger or a spiritual guide. And in terms of the practice, there's been remarkable success over a long period of time in the form of the caliphate. And I had a couple of examples. Um, again, Adam Smith, about his admiration for the, for the caliphate and its inventions, and a former CEO of Hewlett Packard, Carly Fiorina. Um, uh, quite on a similar level, but I'll stop there. 
and that's also in terms of prosperity and uh, equality. But I'll stop there and we'll take a lot of these arguments forward as we move along. Thank you very much.